Greetings, dear brothers and sisters. In the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, once again, to Messiah and Messiah alone be all the praise, honor, and glory. And today is the eighth day, right, Anna? Yes. Yeah, today is the eighth day, dear brothers and sisters, of the ninth month of the year 2020, of course. And today, once again, I'm here to help our 11-year-old daughter, Anna, today, Messiah, one. And I have to share three very urgent visions and two very urgent words. And Anna has the visions, try to draw for the visions for us. And we will, as she shares, we will put it up on screen, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, Messiah telling that Messiah's return is upon us. Today, he's, Messiah is giving the message in the word he's telling as well as. In the vision, he's telling, I am coming. I am coming very soon. Be ye ready, dear brothers and sisters. These are phrases which we have been perhaps listening for weeks and months and years and perhaps over a decade. I am coming or I am coming very soon. Be ye ready, dear brothers and sisters. Let not the familiarity of this phrase once again Take us by surprise. Let us not, since we are very familiar with this phrase, let us not take it. Let the, the importance of that phrase that Messiah is telling, I am coming. I am coming very soon. When first time we heard that, how it resonated in our spirit. Is it the same today? That's a question because dear brothers and sisters, we in our fallen flesh, the tendency in our fallen flesh is such after the fall, something has happened. Something has happened which none of us, none of us can describe what exactly it is, whether it is through the modern frontiers of science or whether whatever kind of explanation we try to get, we don't know. But something has happened that we in our fallen flesh, we initially get excited about something when it is new and then when we keep hearing about it, it, that excitement fades away. That excitement fades away, does, doesn't it, dear brothers and sisters? If we trace back to the evil theory of evolution, dear brothers and sisters, it has its root there. The evil theory of evolution just is not penetrating the, our schools and colleges but it is penetrating in our entire society our thinking we are thinking made to think in that way dear brothers and sisters but when we see in the scriptures despite peter's vast fishing experience he returned from a night's walk with nothing with nothing to show for his efforts now, when Messiah said to Peter to drop the net on the right side of the boat, it's quite possible. It's quite possible that the Lord's request to let the nets down one more time struck him, struck Peter as unreasonable. After all, Peter and his partners were professionals. They used to do this for their living. But nevertheless, the fishermen complied. And his obedience blessed many and was not in vain. Dear brothers and sisters, today we don't quite understand that if Messiah is telling, I am coming, or I am coming very soon, what is happening is, if we are not convinced through proof, visual proof, whether it be gematria, whether it be mathematical calculations, whether it be celestial events, and would not. If we are not convinced in our flesh, we are not able to understand, dear brothers and sisters. That's exactly where, when we start in that path of doubt, when Satan sows that seed of doubt, what do we exactly do? Do we do behave the same way like the broken father of the demon-possessed boy reacted in Mark chapter 9? Lord, help me, Lord. I want to believe. Help me overcome my unbelief, Lord. Or do I go keep searching for more and more and more videos and information and write up to see whether I am convinced in my flesh? Dear brothers and sisters, Bible of course tells us 
to disown the time we are living in, to disown every message, dear brothers and sisters, that includes this message. Yes, but discernment is not an intellectual exercise. Discernment is not a logical exercise. Discernment is a scriptural exercise. God's word says that's why it is so. Because Satan sows that seed of doubt and then he takes us. He lays that minefield of confusion and what we try to do after that is we try to gratify our flesh. Then we don't walk by faith, but we mix up walking by faith inside. Dear brothers and sisters, scripture demonstrates that divine plans often defy human logic. For instance, who would design a battle strategy that involved only marching and shouting? Hashem told Joshua to conquer Jericho that way and doing so proved successful Joshua chapter 6 verses 1 through 5 records that Moses Moshe is another example when he felt unsure about his leadership potential Hashem gave him reassurance in an unusual way by telling him to throw down his staff his walking stick when Moses obeyed God powerfully confirmed his choice of leader exodus 4 1 through 3 recalls that and we do know the miracles which followed which is found in the second book of torah the book of exodus uh, dear brothers and sisters our heavenly father may ask us to do something that seems illogical maybe today he hashim is asking you to do something that believe i am coming believe in me that i am coming without a shadow of doubt believe in me it's not the question when i am coming how i am coming what are the benefits you are going to get if i'm coming it's the question is just taking him at his word just taking him, I am coming today. Maybe our Heavenly Father, maybe Hashem is telling you, maybe our Lord is telling you, asking you to do something that seems illogical. Perhaps to accept more responsibility when we were hoping to reduce our workload or to leave a position that he provided just recently or to take an assignment for which we feel ill-equipped or he is just calling you to step out of your own Step out of your comfort zone and get into that discomfort zone. His plan might feel unrealistic in view of our age, stage of life or health concerns. But we must press forward in obedience regardless of how impractical the request may appear dear brothers and sisters. To grasp the importance of obeying. Let us think, let us think this way. Let us think about children receiving instructions from parents or teachers a careful listening is needed for the task to be done safely and properly right some steps may seem pointless but the rational often becomes clear later your brothers and sisters today as we delve in the word of god let us get in his presence let us petition together that lord please help me to always make a being thee and thee alone my priority the first thing and only thing on my list of to-do lists you know lord how frail i am and how inefficient i am to completely obey you but you are my rock you are my shield you are my strength and great is thy faithfulness. So please, Lord, in your great mercy, in your loving kindness, strengthen me from this day forward, moment by moment, to be obedient to your voice, to be obedient to your word, to be obedient to your calling. And today, let us bow our hearts and let us invite his presence, dear brothers and sisters, as Anna shares with us Messiah's staggering visions and words, as well as the important message for such a time as this once again an important message solely led by Messiah's Ruach and his Ruach alone which Anna will share with us and then depending on the time we'll pick up on the book of the on the book of first Peter our expository learning on the book of first Peter depending on the time so let's bow our hearts dear brothers and sisters and let's bow our heads and let because Messiah must 
must increase and we must decrease. So let us petition so that God's will, Hashem's will be accomplished through us and in us during this time for His greater glory. So let's bow our hearts, let's bow our heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, Holy Father, as we come in thy presence, we just give you all the praise and honor and glory. We thank you, Lord, for being our God, for being our Father, for being a Father to orphans like us. We thank you, Lord, for loving us beyond, beyond, beyond measure. For thy word says, Lord, that... Behold what manner of love that the Father has bestowed on each one of us. Now we are called children of Hashem of our Holy Father. We thank you, Lord. Our minds can never even fathom what that means. Behold what manner of love. Because that agape love, we, there is nowhere we have experienced in this world. It comes from you and you alone. Oh, Holy Father, today we pray that we pray and petition together. Fill our hearts with your agape love, Lord. Help us, Lord. No matter what our circumstances, our situations, wherever we are, we bring all our dear fellow brethren, every single of our dear brothers and sisters in thy presence, no matter what they are going through, Lord, no matter what their situations, their circumstances, horizontally, how they are entangled, Lord, help them, Lord, to have a vertical perspective and help them, Lord, pour out your agape love, Lord, fill them with your spirit, with your walk, help them, Lord, once again, to meet you, Lord, please, if it's your will, Lord, please reveal yourself to each one of us through this word, through this message, Lord, so that you be glorified. Lord, may you be glorified at all times through us and in us. We thank you, Lord, that you have called each one of us by thy grace and thy grace alone. God's riches at Christ's expense. And not by any merit of our own. We thank you, Holy Father, that you have allowed your only begotten Son, our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, to purchase our liberty from the law, to purchase our redemption, our access to you. And Father, we thank you that you have, in, the, in this time, in the days that remain, Lord, you have not left us as orphans. You have sent your Ruach, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, that he is so diligent to open the scriptures to the diligent, to know you, Lord, to know you more and more and more with every passing day. Oh, Holy Father, as we begin to embrace and understand as you unfold through your Ruach, the tapestry of redemption, oh, Holy Father, so deep is your tapestry of redemption, your message of redemption, oh, Holy Father, so deep is your amazing love, is your amazing grace today. Lord, as we come to you, as we come to you, your word says, oh, come taste and see how gracious, how good the Lord is, because you are good, oh, Holy Father, today, help each and every single of our dear fellow brethren, Lord, to come and and taste to come and taste and be partakers from the fountain of living water for your greater glory lord may your message may your appointed people pierce their hearts lord once again pierce their hearts like the first message message which peter preached about the cross about the cross of our messiah which pierced their hearts today let your message pierce the hearts of all our dear fellow brethren, your appointed people, Lord. And pray, Lord, may you be glorified. May your purposes be accomplished at this time. Once again, I bring Anna and myself in thy presence, Lord. And pray, Lord, to thee, please be our strength, Lord. Please, please be our strength in our weaknesses, Lord. We anoint every alphabet which comes out of our mouths, Lord. Whatever is not from you, please let it not happen, Lord. Through us it is impossible, but Matthew 19, 26 says and gives us the hope that through Hashem, everything, everything, everything is possible. Everything is possible. So today we claim on Psalm 141 verse 3 and pray, Father, that please do set a guard over our mouths and keep watch over the door of our lips as we convey thy message, Lord, to thy appointed people. And in the name of our coming and reigning King, Yeshua HaMashiach. Using our authority of Luke 10, 19, we bind every evil of the enemy which is coming at this time, which is coming at this message, coming at all of your fellow brethren, and we pray. We pray for the hedge of protection for each one of us. And Father, once again, we pray that we pray, may this message reach to your appointed people, Lord, to accomplish your mighty will. And please, please do enlighten the hearts and minds of all of your fellow brethren through your Holy Spirit. To understand, Lord, what you precisely have for each one of them 
through this message. All this we pray in the holy name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our Lord, our Savior, our reigning and coming King. Indeed, Amen, amen. and Amen, and Amen. And you can please go ahead and... So on the 25th day of the 8th month of this year, 2020, they heard the Lord say, My child, I am coming. Tell my people that my return is indeed upon you. There is no more time. Trust in my word at all times. Times are perilous. Be in my presence at all times. Shalom. And on the first day of the ninth month of this year, 2020, I heard the Lord say, My child, I am coming very soon. Tell my people to be ready and keep their eyes fixed on me. Hold fast, hold fast what you have until I come. And coming to the visions which the Lord wanted us to share, the first one was on the 25th day of the 8th month of this year, 2020. And I saw a shining silver arch with a rainbow painted on it. It was like it was standing in moving waters, and I could also see the reflection of the arch in the water. The background was like a cloudy sky just after it rains with a little sunlight. On the surface of the water, I saw the words, I am coming, written in purple. And that was the end of the vision. Staggering, 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 dear brothers and sisters. Messiah is telling, I am coming. I am coming once again. Because we have heard this over and over again, dear brothers and sisters. The urgency, the urgency of Messiah's return is still, as Messiah is telling, it is upon us. Let our response be in thankfulness, in gratitude. That come, Lord Jesus Come, Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach. Come, Bo, Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach. Bo, come Lord Jesus. And you can please go ahead. The second vision was on the second day of the ninth month of this year, 2020. And I saw some clouds in the sky. And there was also a light shining from inside them. Over the clouds, I saw the words, Rapture is imminent, written in red. And that was the end of the vision. Rapture is indeed imminent, dear brothers and sisters. That we try to understand imminency in our dimension. Messiah is hyperdimensional. Rapture is imminent. In his dimension means it is the next scheduled event on his calendar, dear brothers and sisters. Let us understand that. And you can please go ahead, Anna. And the third vision, the last one, was on the second day, of, was also on the second day of the ninth month of this year, 2020. And I saw a butterfly and its wings were pink and blue in color. And the words, be ready, were written in orange above the butterfly. That was a flash vision, and that was the end of the vision. Hashem, our Heavenly Father, is telling us the butterfly symbolizes how, how does, what do we see? How the life cycle of butterfly, how do we see? It's a metamorphosis, right? There is a transformation. The same way Hashem is telling us the transformation of our lowly bodies is about to take place. The corruptible is about to put on incorruptible and that's why Hashem is telling us be ye ready it is time to be ready dear brothers and sisters and you can please go ahead so today we see that Lord Jesus Christ is once again reminding us that he is coming soon and extremely soon to take us all home and while we wait the Lord Jesus Christ is telling all of us to be in his presence and be ready today when we look around we often feel discouraged because it seems like we've been waiting for so long and still the rapture hasn't happened. But let's remember that our responsibility is not about knowing when the rapture will take place. Rather, our responsibility is to persevere until Christ does come. That's what the scripture tells us. In Luke chapter 19, Christ was nearing Jerusalem and the disciples were thinking that Christ would become king there. However, Lord Jesus Christ told them a parable, the par parable of the minas, to tell them that they were to focus on occupying till he comes, not on when he will come. Today we talk a lot about rapture, but do we truly understand what it is about? As we approach the day of trumpets on the Jewish calendar, let's recall what this is really about. God had appointed seven festivals for the Jews. Three in the spring, one in the summer, and three in the fall or in autumn. The seven feasts were the Feast of Passover on the 14th of Nisan, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on, which was an eight-day celebration from Nisan 15th through the 22nd of Nisan, the Feast of Firstfruits on the 17th of Nisan, 
the Feast of Weeks on the 6th of Sivan, the Feast of Trumpets, or Day of Trumpets, on the 1st of Tishri, the Day of Atonement on the 10th of Tishri, and the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th of Tishri. And it was a seven-day celebration till the 22nd. In the fall, they celebrated the Day of Trumpets, or Yom Teruah, as Leviticus chapter 23, verses 23 through 25 tells us, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, according to Leviticus chapter 23, verses 26 through 32, as well as Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 through 34, and finally, the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, according to Leviticus chapter 23, verses 33 through 43, and Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. In the book of Genesis, we read that the month of Aviv is the seventh month, according to Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. Aviv is another name for Nisan, the month of Nisan. But in the book of Exodus, when God ordained the Passover, he told Moses that the month in which they celebrated the Passover, the month of Nisan, was to be their first month. Prior to that, Tishri was the first month and Nisan was the seventh month, but from the first Passover and onwards, Nisan was the first month and Tishri was the seventh. So in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 23 through 25, God ordained the first of Tishri as a holy day for the Jews. God said that on the first of Tishri, they were to have a Sabbath rest and were to do no customary work on it. But it didn't always have to be a Saturday. It was just another day of rest. God said they were to have a Sabbath rest, blow trumpets, and offer a burnt offering. And that was all God specified about this day. He did not give any further directions. But the Jews traditionally celebrated it with a number of shofar blasts. Let's understand more about the shofar. The shofar was made of the ram's horn, as we all know, and it is different from a trumpet. However, the word trumpet is often used in the scripture to refer to the shofar. The difference is that the shofar is from a ram's horn and the trumpet is made of metal. In the Torah, the Israelites used shofars as their trumpets to announce or declare anything. Then, in the book of Numbers, God told Moses to make two silver trumpets to call the assembly together. The point is, there were two different kinds of trumpets, the ram's horn and the metal trumpet. In Yom Tero, they used shofars. But today, let's understand the significance of what the shofar represents. A shofar or ram's horn has to be clear to make sound, right? For the breath of the blower to flow through the shofar and make the sound, the shofar needs to be clean. The Hebrew word for breath is ruach, and in Greek, it is pneuma. Both words can also mean spirit. In order for God's spirit to flow through and work in our lives, we must be clean and clear of all obstructions. Let's take a look at two scriptures about the trumpet, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. Joel chapter 2 verse 1 tells us, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. So here we see that the trumpet is referred to as an alarm, or a way of alerting others. In the scripture, we see trumpets used for many different purposes and reasons, such as to call together an assembly, to call the people for war, to announce a fast, to announce any celebration, the beginning of a month, a feast, or, and so on, and in worship as a musical instrument. The Hebrew word for trumpet in Joel chapter 2 verse 1 is shofar, basically the ram's horn. The word shofar comes from the root word shafar. The word shafar means to glisten, to be fair or clear. It reminds us of Exodus chapter 1. In Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh's attempt to wipe out the Israelites is recorded. We see that Pharaoh tries to wipe out the Israelites by trying to destroy the male children. First, Pharaoh commanded the Hebrew midwives to kill all the male children when they did the duties of a midwife, but to let the daughters live. But the midwives feared God, Exodus chapter 1 tells us, so they did not do what the Egyptian king commanded. And eventually God provided households for these God-fearing women. But the point is, although there are many midwives, two of them are named in Exodus chapter 1. The names of two of these women were Pua and Shifra. Shifra comes from the same root word, Shafar, 
Shifra is basically the feminine form. It means glistening. But coming back, the point is that the root word of shofar means clear or glistening. Thus, we see that the shofar is what it is because of the clear sound. The shofar sound must be very clear. Why? Because that is what makes the shofar what it is. Today, are we truly clear in order for God to give a clear message through us? If the shofar is obstructed, it might, it might make some sound depending on how obstructed it is. But no matter what, it cannot make the clear sound that it is supposed to. So we understand that in order for God to be able to make our lives a clear message from Him, we must be clear from all obstructions that will hinder it. Let's now take a look at a New Testament scripture regarding the trumpet. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8, For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So we understand that the trumpet has to make the right sound in order for the assembly to be called together. The context here was, of course, about speaking in tongues, but here we are talking about something else. Hopefully we can get the point across. The Greek word translated trumpet here is salpinx. It has its roots in the word sino, which is related to the word sio. Sio means to rock, or in other words, to vibrate, sideways or to and fro. The word sino means to wag or shake. From the word sino comes the word salos, from which calls from which comes salpinx. The word salos means vibration or a wave of sound. So we see that the word salpinx means a trumpet through the idea of reverberation or the sound. Today are our lives a message from God? Do our lives demonstrate the power of God? That's what makes a true believer what he or she is, the power of God. Now let's understand a few of the ways in which trumpets were used in the scripture. Number one, trumpets were blown on the new moon or a feast day, Psalm chapter 81, verse 3. As we saw earlier, Leviticus chapter, Leviticus chapter 23 records the seven feasts that the Jews celebrated because God had ordained. In all, however, the Jews commemorated 70 appointed times or Hamoedim per year. They also commemorated the new moons because their calendar followed the moon. Each month began when the new moon appeared. And that's why feasts like Passover and the first day of Sukkot always took place on a full moon. Number two, a trumpet was also blown to call the people together for war. Judges chapter 6 verse 34, 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 3, 2 Samuel chapter 18 verse 16, Jeremiah chapter 42 verse 14, and Hosea chapter 8 verse 1. As true believers, our lives should be a message to others that we are in a spiritual battle. We are fighting a real enemy, but a defeated enemy. There are two mistakes we may make about the enemy. Number one, to act as if he doesn't exist, living carelessly and without any concern for our spiritual life. The second mistake we may make about the enemy is to become so conscious about him that we undermine the victory Christ has won for us and render more credit to the enemy than necessary. We must understand that Satan is a real but defeated enemy. We are only to claim the victory that Lord Jesus Christ has already won for us, as the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And as God's shofar, we are to alert others of the spiritual warfare we are involved in. Number three, trumpets were used as a musical instrument in worshiping God. Psalm chapter 47, verse 5, chapter 150, verse 3, and Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 2. Today, it is our responsibility to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, because that is God's will for us, as Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. And our lives also ought to be a message to others, that they may see it and glorify God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. These are three of the many ways in which trumpets were used in the scripture. Today, when we talk about the shofar, let us remember that we are to be the shofar through which God's spirit can flow. That's the key. Today, let us remember that as God's shofar, we are to keep our lives and motives clean. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. By yielding to the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit and not grieving the Holy Spirit. Our lives are to be a message to others, not just our words, but our actions, our daily lives. Let us today remember that Lord Jesus Christ has called us to be the salt of the earth 
and the light of the world. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Before we end today, let us revisit Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, and see what Lord Jesus Christ is telling us. Lord Jesus Christ says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then, it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill, on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. So today, let us yield to the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, as he makes us more and more like Lord Jesus Christ, day by day. And before we end today, here are a few questions for us to examine ourselves. Number one. What is a shofar, and what is a trumpet, and what is the difference between them? Number two, what were trumpets used for in the scripture? Number three, how are we Gad's shofar? Number four, if we are indeed Gad's shofar, how are we to live? And number five, what have you learned from this message? Lord Jesus Christ is coming extremely soon. Today let us be in his presence and trust in him. And today, let us fight the good fight, keep up the faith, and finish this race strong. Thank you, everybody, for viewing us, and may Lord Jesus Christ bless you all in abundance. Amen. Amen, and amen, and amen. Once again, thank you so much, Anna, for not only sharing the staggering visions and was reminding, and which Messiah is reminding us that Messiah's return is truly upon us, but in the days that remain, in the days that remain, it is so very Crucial to be our Savior's shofar. Are we going to be our Savior's shofar? Or are we going to give in to the satanic scheme of the shining one? That's the question, dear brothers and sisters. Because if we are not aligned on the y-axis, we cannot be Savior's shofar. When we go and see the attributes of Messiah's sheep, we might not like it. When we read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through till the end, it's in itself a staggering, dear brothers and sisters. If the Lord leads you, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, they are truly staggering chapters. If you haven't gotten a chance lately to dwell on it, Please do go for it. Where the first quality, first attribute of being Messiah's true sheep is foolish. Foolish. That's not our conjecture. That's what Messiah's inerrant and infallible word is telling. But when somebody tells us you are foolish, we don't quite like it. If we don't like it, then we are not accepting the fact that Messiah, I belong to Messiah because me belonging to Messiah, I am worldly foolish. That's what Messiah is telling. That's what Messiah's word tells. As a matter of fact, real quick, before we get into 1 Peter expository study, real quick, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's pick it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's pick it up around verse 20. Verse 26, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's pick it up around verse 26, dear brothers and sisters. Paul records, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world. God has chosen the foolish things of the world. I claim to be Messiah's sheep. I am saved by his precious, priceless, holy blood. Who am I then? For God has chosen the foolish things of the world. Let us ingrain that, dear brothers and sisters. Let us ingrain that. The world... In this world, our flesh wants to 
at all times rebel and say that I am who I am this I am that and it's all about boasting in the flesh but God has chosen the foolish things of the world if our hermeneutical hygiene is not in place and hermeneutics is once again a fancy way for telling the scriptural interpretation dear brothers and sisters if our hermeneutical hygiene is not in place if we truly start allegorizing every scripture that this is just an allegory which Paul is telling us if we start allegorizing scriptures we see what has happened down in the last 2000 years what has happened with all the different not only doctrinal debates but with what has happened about all the amillennialists those who believe that there won't be any millennium literally that messiah truly won't be sitting on the throne of david and ruling for 1000 years which angel gabriel himself promised Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 the prophecy of Messiah when angel Gabriel actually fulfills the prophecy and comes and tells Miriam the mother of Yeshua HaMashiach there angel Gabriel tells what angel Gabriel talks about Messiah ruling for thousand years sitting from the throne of David did Messiah fulfill that was there a throne of David when Messiah came? The Jews were not even in power at that point of time. The Romans were ruling, right? When we talk about that millennial, millennium is an allegory. We are trying to tell God that Hashem is a liar, dear brothers and sisters. Allegorizing scriptures, trying to do eisegesis. We have a thought and trying to interpret and make that thought true to fit our rhetoric to fit fit our narrative trying to use a scripture we'll always be deceived somehow or the other we'll always be deceived satan will get us unless we take our thoughts captive before reading the scripture claiming on second corinthians chapter 10 verses 5 and 6 it's a scriptural imperative to take our thoughts captive all those wandering thoughts which is not of Messiah to take it captive then only our minds can be renewed when we read the scripture when we our minds are renewed Romans 12 1 and 2 then only we can understand God's will God's word what he has for us the first and foremost thing God says that God has chosen the foolish things of the world today can I go on rooftop and say I am foolish I am foolish I am foolish how does it feel Will we be able to do that for our Lord, our Adonai? That's a question. That's a lingering question, dear brothers and sisters. And that's not it. The first will be last and the last will be first. So we are called to be the last. The foolish last. And when we go to Matthew chapter 19, we see that we are also called as our one of our attribute is loser we are losers we are foolish and we are last how does it sound now it doesn't appeal to our flesh we don't quite hear these from the modern pulpits do we dear brothers and sisters that's the truth that's the truth that worldly once again that's what is denying our flesh as we were saying the other day that is what is denying our flesh that is what is picking up our cross and following Messiah daily, irrespective what our circumstances are, our situations are, what the horizontal entrapments are, irrespective of that. God will empower us. We don't follow him with our own strength. No, no and no. God, Spirit, Messiah's Ruach indwells us. The Spirit which raised Messiah. From death, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 indwells us. How have we experienced the power of that spirit? The indwelling Holy Spirit, indwelling Ruach HaKodesh, have I experienced that power which raised Messiah from death? Is it just to fulfill all my fleshly desires and gratify 
all my fleshly desires, is that what the Holy Spirit is for? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But today we won't derail our study, dear brothers and sisters. So the question is, are we going to be our Messiah, Savior's shofar? Or are we going to give in to the satanic schemes of the shining one in the days that remain? Because there is the word play there. That shofar, the breath should flow through shofar as Anna was sharing with us. And the breath is also called ruach. His spirit, Messiah's spirit through, should flow through every single true born again believers for us to be truly honoring, exalting, worshiping, worshiping and glorifying our Heavenly Father. So today, let's go to we were, last time we were looking we are at 1 Peter 4, 17, where Peter talks about, where Peter says, For the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And today we saw that through, as we heard in the beginning, as Messiah led us to talk about through Moses, through Joshua, that what obedience to Peter, what obedience is about. So we, as long led us, we did take a look at what exactly is obedience, what exactly is disobedience, and what is obedience according to the scriptures. So we did take a look at Philippians 2, 12 through 16, about working out our salvation with trembling and fear. Then Lord led us to Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25, where Messiah talks about following Messiah 101, and then... Coming down to the end of the chapter, we were at Luke chapter 9, there verses 57 through 62. We see three, three persons, three people, three people. One Messiah calls, the Messiah calls him that follow me. And two of them come and say that I want to follow you. And let's see what Messiah's response was. Each time. So Luke 9, 57 and 58. We did take a look at it, but we will real quick brush through that. Luke chapter 9. Let's Luke chapter 9. Let's turn to if you would please open up your Bibles. Luke chapter 9. Verses 57. Let's real real quick together read that. So Messiah says. Now here Luke records, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Messiah said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And last time we were talking about that. That's a very strange response when we try to see our modern 21st century or 20th century as a matter of fact. The late 20th century, we should say. That if we see that mode of evangelism, nobody has ever, when the pastor in the in the church, from the pulpit, when they ask, do you want to receive Lord Jesus Christ in your heart? They raised their hand, they said yes, and slipped out of the line. Then the pastor did not say that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. There's a lot going on, dear brothers and sisters. There's a lot going on in that scripture. As a matter of fact, every scripture we see it can be studied at four levels. Four levels as we know of. One is the one is the exegesis, exegetical level, what the text is telling us. One is the homiletic, homiletic application, personal application of the scripture. The other is the remez, the hidden meaning behind that scripture. The hidden gems in that scripture, which Ruach HaKodesh has for us, as Proverbs 25 2 tells us, that to unfold, that Ruach HaKodesh will unfold it for us if we seek Him diligently. And the fourth level is, of course, the prophetic level, which we are excited about in these end moments. But scripture has four levels. As a matter of fact, this scripture has so much going on. Messiah is talking about foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. What does that mean? Why did he take the example of foxes and birds? Did we ever think about it? When, where in the scripture did Messiah 
talk about, refer to anybody as Fox in the scripture. What was Messiah referring to? Herod, King Herod. With the same title, right? Then we see the birds, birds of the air. In Matthew chapter 13, it is established, we see the, when Messiah says the first kingdom parable, the parable of the sower, the birds of the air, the birds come and take away the seed. Who did the bird represent there? Satan, the enemy, Satan. Expositional, there is something called expositional constancy, dear brothers and sisters. That's just a fancy way of telling that the idioms all across the scriptures will be typically consistent. Idioms all across the scriptures will be typically consistent. And coming to that, thinking of that, if we do a study of the rocks and stones, Petra and Petros, we will make some staggering, staggering discoveries if we let Ruach HaKodesh teach us, dear brothers and sisters, if the Lord leads you, please, please do go for it. Doing word study is basically, once again, if you have a Strong's, Strong's Concordance, you can pull it up and go from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, wherever that word appears, they will in whichever scripture basically Strong's Concordance will show up or if you don't have a Strong's Concordance you can do use your whatever if you're using the Bible Gateway website or if you have an app however dear brothers and sisters you can do a search and make please do make a note of those scriptures and go through them perhaps one or two scriptures at a time please spend some time let Ruach HaKodesh speak let those word be quickened by his Ruach and see how staggering it will be, dear brothers and sisters. So coming back, expositional constancy, once again, it's a fancy term for telling that the idioms all across the scriptures is consistent. So Messiah is telling us the, about the sufficiency that foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, dear brothers and sisters. When we follow Messiah, when we follow Messiah, the Master did not have any place to lay his head. Is once again, as we saw last time, that Messiah's response was that a person desiring to follow him must give up what others consider necessities. Messiah had no home of his own, nor did his followers. That's a lesson which we all need to learn, dear brothers and sisters. Today we don't hear that. That's why the warning Paul gave, the warning, dear brothers and sisters, in today's message, contemporary message, whether it be a Bible scholar, teacher, so, social media teacher from the modern pulpits, whatever we are hearing, we always... We always want to hear which and which gratifies our flesh. We can label it as blessing. We can label it as encouragement. We can label it as motivation. We can label it all the different terms. But we always want to hear something which gratifies our flesh because we are not ready to deny our flesh. And we cannot. That's why we... Go and run to our prayer closet and spend hours there, dear brothers and sisters, because blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, am I? Am I confessing that? Am I spending time? In my prayer closet, trying to know him, confessing, Lord, here I am poor in spirit. Oh, Lord, it was never about my sufficiency, but always about my insufficiency and about your sufficiency, which you have accomplished on the cross of Calvary for a filth like me. I come here broken, Lord. I come to you shocked. 
How could you, Lord? How could you? Today we don't quite understand what is pure in heart, what is broken in spirit. We want to hear, we talk about Holy Spirit, but this is a Holy Spirit which scripture doesn't talk about. Because the Holy Spirit always convicts about sin, righteousness and judgment. Today, we condone sin and condemn righteousness. That's the time we are living in. Evil is called good and good is called evil, heroes and sisters. The time we are living in, living in now, this is the time where Messiah talked about do not be deceived. This is the time to truly exercise our spiritual discernment using the scriptures, not intellectual ability. Paul talks about in Colossians 2.8. Beware, beware, be aware, lest anyone cheat you through. So how can people cheat us? Philosophy through empty deceit, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. A lot can be said about that scripture, dear brothers and sisters. Beware, what are we supposed to be? Because Messiah's command was do not be deceived. And Paul is now breaking it down for us, giving us a working definition of what exactly deception will look like in these end moments. What exactly deception will look like is do not lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. We all like to hear something which is relevant. Philosophy. Because we understand that we try to take a worldly example we hear from modern pulpits taking a worldly example of some story of somebody here and trying to compare it with the scripture and telling God has blessed him tremendously with so many materialistic position. God said that the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Abundant life is about abundant possessions. A big house. The best car. All kinds of promotions. All kinds of horizontal pursuits in our work. All kinds of ambitions. That's abundant life is that. And that's truly dear brothers and sisters. Once again, please don't get us wrong. That is exactly the time we are living in. These are called as do not love the things of the world. Was a command which was a mandate. First John 2 15. Not our words. Messiah's inerrant and infallible word. Every word is God breathed. Second Timothy 3 16. Theopinustus. Where second, first John, let's take a quick look before we come to that. Please do keep your place in Luke chapter 9, verse 58. We are first John, if you would please turn to together. Let's look at this, dear brothers and sisters. Please don't take my word or any or David's or anybody's, any Bible scholar, teacher, preacher. Nobody, dear brothers and sisters. Please let us be Actabarians because Acts 17, 11 tells us, let us be Actabarians. Two qualities, receiving with an open mind, which is a very hard thing to do. Because what we learn, we cannot unlearn. That's the most difficult situation we get into and then we get deceived. So receiving with an open mind and then going back and checking in the scripture. Is that so? Is that true? Please don't take my word or anybody's word, dear brothers and sisters. Please let us together be Actabarians. Let only Ruach HaKodesh teach each one of us the author himself. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 tells us, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So what is this abundant life about? John 10.10 10, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. What is this abundant life about? About all the worldly persons? Because if I have that, then the love of the Father is not in me, First John 2, 15 tells us. Because we don't dig in the scriptures, because we don't like to 
hear things, we only like to hear things which gratifies our flesh. We only like to hear things that Messiah died on the cross so that we can have all kinds of pleasures down here on planet Earth. That's not why Lord Jesus Christ died. We are nullifying the cross, dear brothers and sisters. When we hear such messages, we are really nullifying the cross. Lord Jesus Christ died so that you and me can be set free from the curse of sin. And now we can be the doulos of our curios, Jesus Christos. A very heavy price was paid. The transaction above every transaction. But he was wounded for my transgressions. For our transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. For our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. If that's the only thing we see in Isaiah... 53 5 then out of all men we are perhaps the most pitiful we are perhaps the most carnal and most pitiful if out of all that in Isaiah 53 5 if only we claim on by his stripes we are healed we are truly out of all human we are more carnal, most carnal and most pitiful because it says Messiah the king of kings the lord of lords our creator, the creator of microcosm, macrocosm, metacosm, creator of what we can see and what we cannot see, came down. He came and died an excruciating death. He was obedient, obedient to the point of death. And today we condemn obedience. What happened to the scripture telling that a servant is not greater than his master? What happened to that? So let's remember Paul is telling us, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. Philosophical preaching has no place in the scripture. It is a mode of deception. That's what scripture is telling us. Please don't take my word. Take it to the Lord. Take it to your prayer closet. Let the Holy Spirit, let Ruach HaKodesh teach you, give you more scriptures, show you more about it. Lead you to Matthew chapter 24 verses 4 through 6. That's the time we are living in through philosophy. Well, scripture said that I need to be as wise as serpents. So I don't understand why God will choose the uh, foolish. That's a contradiction. I need to be as wise as a serpent, dear brothers and sisters. We need to be beware of such teaching. We need to let Ruach HaKodesh, Messiah's Ruach, speak to our hearts. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, number one. Number two, empty deceits. Through all this celestial alignment or mathematical calculation, through this or that, something very, which stimulates, which are adrenaline. The canic elements are stimulated through understanding and saying that, okay, Messiah has revealed to me the day, exact specific date and time of rapture, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, please don't get us wrong, dear brothers and sisters. As Messiah tells us, yes, rapture is imminent. We indeed, from in the heart of our hearts, we truly believe. And so many of our fellow brethren can say amen to that. We truly believe that rapture is imminent. It is any moment. That any moment is not any moment when we want to crack when that is. We are just blessed and honored and privileged to live in that time when we see the word of God is coming alive, dear brothers and sisters. It is time to be prostrate in front of the cross and say, Oh my God, how great thou art! A true reverence, a true awe of His majesty, of Yeshua HaMashiach is today what we need. And we cannot have it. Only God and His Ruach 
when we yield to his ruach, when then only the shofar can sound through us. Yes, rapture is imminent, but at the same time, none of us will ever know the date of rapture. Otherwise, in the last 200 years, we would have known. And this, once again, there is wherever there is doubt. Now, Satan will, has created this minefield of confusion. Well, God has been telling that rapture is imminent. It is not happening, so it is not. You are hallucinating. We have to go through this seven year of tribulation and it happens, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, once again, we as Messiah, let us read it, a study on that. We truly believe in the pre-trib rapture. And there are tens of scriptures comparing what is the second coming of Christ and the rapture. Let us not get confused between rapture of the church, rapture of Messiah's bride and second coming of Christ. Those are two different events and we will try to once again leave the link to that message which we did or if you have any questions please please don't hesitate to get back to us to contact us our contact will will be in the description box our, our comment section are open let us learn together let us learn together as Proverbs says iron sharpens iron let us learn together let his ruach teach us dear brothers and sisters we are in the last moments together we will be going to spend our eternity in heaven let us lay aside all our differences. It is never about what my opinion is. Where do I get the audacity to have an opinion the day when His precious, priceless, holy blood, the miracle of salvation entered my life, then 1 Corinthians 2 became active, that I determined brethren among you to know nothing except Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and Him crucified. That's it. That's all what we need to know, dear brothers and sisters. That's all what we need to know. Good for eternity. Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. For I determined to know nothing except Lord Jesus Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach and Him crucified. We don't need philosophies. We don't need empty deceit, dear brothers and sisters. These are all... What Messiah told us, do not be deceived. So what does that mean? Now Paul is giving us a walking definition. How we will be deceived. How will the deceptive ministers, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, talks about the attributes of these deceptive ministers. Please don't get us wrong, dear brothers and sisters. These are scriptural hard, scriptural truths. We see it unfolding right in front of our eyes, dear brothers and sisters. It is time to truly be in our prayer closet. It is time truly to pray so that Messiah's will be done. Oftentimes we pray in so many churches, building churches, they pray, Thy kingdom come. 99.99% of them have no idea what does it mean, Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come as we are talking about the millennium kingdom of Messiah's millennial rule. Thousand years rule from sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem, Jerusalem and ruling. What a time, what a time, what a time it will be in the light of that, dear brothers and sisters. Everything fades away. We don't need philosophies. We don't need empty deceits and Telling that I have the rapture date. We don't need a rapture date. It's not about the gift. It's about the giver. Blessed are those who will be found watching. I am watching. I am not cracking rapture dates. Luke chapter 12 verses 35 through 37. And when we go a little further down and read verses 38 through 40. We understand that we will not know the time when he's returning the hour when he is returning oh we will probably know the season we will know this and that dear brothers and sisters that's a slippery slope let us be thankful that we are indeed the generation who is seeing so much so much that the word of god is coming alive the Bible talks about this time even more than when Messiah himself walked the shores in, of Galilee or climbed the mountains in Judea, dear brothers and sisters. That's the truth. 
And then Paul says, Colossians 2, 8. Paul says, beware lest anyone cheat you through. Number one, philosophy. Number two, empty deceit. Number three, according to the basic principles of the world. That's where we fall into. Traditions of the world. And not according to Christ. Basic principles of the world. We see things working in the world. In that way, we try to interpret scriptures from the worldly lens. Big, big, big mistake. Big mistake. Satan has placed his ministers in modern pulpits. Big, big, big building churches. To do this particular role. When Satan cannot beat us, he will join us. That's what we understand from the church of Pergamos, right? When persecution to the church of Smyrna, we see what? The second church, there was, and staggering, that's a staggering study in itself, dear brothers and sisters. The seven churches, Messiah himself wrote the letters, the report card of the seven churches are declared already. Have we paid heed to that, dear brothers and sisters? As a matter of fact, Messiah led us to do a study on that, put up a study on that. We will we'll definitely try to find the, find the link and put it in our description box. And if not, if you're interested, please do, please do contact us, dear brothers and sisters. If Messiah's will be done, if Messiah leads you, please do not hesitate to contact us. In the seven churches, the second church was Smyrna. What happened there? In the Smyrna, we see so much of persecution. Nothing happened. They stood strong for Messiah, empowered by his Ruach. What did then Satan do? When Persecution didn't work because persecution only makes the true church, true church, Messiah's true body becomes stronger with persecution. That's what scripture tells us. Then Satan joins the church. Oftentimes, Satan will be standing on that pulpit or will be sitting in the first bench in the pews, dear brothers and sisters. Please don't get us wrong because that's the word of God says. Poor Gamos. That's what we see. Satan marries the church. That is poor Gamos means. And that's the time we are living in basic principles of the world. We don't interpret scriptures according to worldly principles. And that's why Paul says not according to Christ. What is according to Christ? According to Christ is Luke 9, 23 through 25. The message is the same. If you truly want to serve me, deny, deny your flesh. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. The question is not why me, Lord, going through this. The question is, I thank you, Lord, for choosing me for this time, for such a time as this, to go through this suffering. But, Lord, you know how frail and how weak I am. Lord, give me the strength so that you be glorified through me. I cannot do it, Lord. But I come to you and I rely on your strength, dear brothers and sisters. In our weaknesses only we will be made strong. In our insufficiencies and inadequacies only we will be made strong. If we have figured it all out, how can we be, how can we be made strong? Figure it all out. Go to the building that organized building church. Build on some pseudo humility and some pseudo and some self righteousness and think I'm good. Is that the reason Lord Jesus Christ shed his precious, priceless, holy blood for a filth like me so that I can go to the organized building on Sunday and that's it? Perhaps, dear brothers and sisters, that's the worst place we can ever be because that does not teach us to have a relationship with our Redeemer. We need to know Him and know Him personally. The only way to know Him is through His Word, spending time with Him and diligently being obedient to Him. Whenever we fail, running to Him. It's not about the perfection. It's about the direction which He has for us, yielding to it. 
So that's what Paul tells us, dear brothers and sisters. And Paul, as a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 2.13 tells us the same thing. 1 Corinthians 2.13, if you would please turn to 1 Corinthians 2.13, Paul tells us the same thing again. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We don't take holy things and try to interpret scriptures. Big, big mistake. That is exactly the deception what Messiah was talking about, dear brothers and sisters. And let's let's go back to our text. Hopefully we will be able to finish at least our text for Luke chapter 9. So we were, Luke chapter 9, we are at verse 58. The Messiah says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then the second person, now the second person, then he said, then Messiah said to another, follow me, follow me. These words, do you recall dear brothers and sisters? Follow me. The words would change Simon Peter's life. Follow me. Is he calling you today to drop the net? Today is the day. Drop the net, dear brothers and sisters. Please drop the net. Trust in him. The one who came down to die for you and me. To create you and me and die for you and me so that we can be redeemed from our sin, from our flesh. Can we not trust him today? If he says, follow me, can we not drop the net? And please let us remember, dear brothers and sisters, that Simon Peter was not doing fishing. Peter and Andrew were not doing fishing as their hobby as we see these days. It was their livelihood. They dropped the net and they followed him. John and James, the sons of Zebedee. The sons of Zebedee, what did they do when Messiah called? They left their father. Luke 9, 23 through 25, we see unfolding real time. Today, follow me does not mean anything to us. Follow me is just one decision. We slip out of the line or nowadays we are in the tech savvy world. We just say one prayer, repeat it. And that's pretty much about it. Follow me does not mean anything, does it? But Messiah, when he says, follow me, the 101 of following Messiah is laid out. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Luke chapter 9, what we are reading now, verses 57 onwards. So he said, now Messiah said to another, follow me. What did the person respond? He said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. The sons of Zebedee did not respond in the same manner. Messiah's mode of evangelizing has not changed. Do we see that, dear brothers and sisters? Over the period of time, whatever the gospel has been watered down and lots of things, in lots of directions, lots of philosophies, Lots of empty deceit. Lots of basic principles of the world has been added. But Messiah's word has, is not diluted. He called the same way Simon Peter and Andrew. To John and his brother James. The sons of Zebedee. And he is calling the same way to this person. Follow me. And his response is different now. He is not responding like John and James. He is telling, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. What is wrong in that? What is wrong in that? So as a matter of fact, there are good scholars on all having many opinions about it. Some, some as a matter of fact, think that some, some think that the man's father was perhaps dead already. Some, and it would seem strange if that was the case, as a matter of fact, for he would certainly have been engaged in the burial procedure already but some also think that the man's reply was that he first wanted to go and bury his father but it is perhaps more likely more likely 
which we speculate that the father was perhaps ready to die. His request was perhaps to let him wait just a little while before following Messiah. Perhaps, perhaps, and all these are once again speculation, dear brothers and sisters, that perhaps the man also wanted to receive the inheritance from his father's estate. We don't know, but dear brothers and sisters, the point is when Messiah says, drop the net, it is time to drop the net. Uh, well, the plan is to follow Messiah, but let me let me get this accomplished first. Let me go for this horizontal pursuit first. Let me get this abundant life first, this materialistic position first. An abundant life in x-axis, of course, we are talking about because Messiah, what he spoke in John 10, 10, that abund abundant life is aligned on y-axis. It's talking about abundant life, of life eternal, life in his kingdom, life in Messiah's millennium. So Messiah says what now? What, what was Messiah's response to this person? It will sound, all the responses what Messiah has will sound very rude today. And we will say that we don't have, if you don't have love, you have nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, discernment. We have forgotten the discipline of spiritual discernment. Today's spiritual discernment is all an intellectual exercise when we don't feel good in the flesh. But spiritual discernment, we, when we see Matthew chapter 16, the staggering moment, Simon Peter's staggering moment. When Peter declares, Messiah is the son of God. Thou art Christ, the son of God. Staggering moment. After that, what happens? Then Messiah talks. Following the conversation, Matthew chapter 16 records, and of course I'm paraphrasing that, then Messiah talks about his upcoming death, which he has to die for humanity. He who knew no sin will be made sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. So Messiah talks about the upcoming crucifixion, the excruciating death. And Peter comes and says, no, death be far away from you. These things are not going to happen to you. And that's not a bad thing, right? It's a Peter, Simon Peter is a well-wisher. He's wanting good for Messiah, but Messiah discerned that voice. And what did Messiah say for Peter's good comments? What did, what did Messiah say? Get thee behind me, you Satan. Very strange. Messiah's reaction doesn't fit our description of 20th century and 21st century Christianity, does it? The person says, please give me some time here. When Messiah asked him, follow me. The person asks, some time, please give me some time. I want to bury my father and come back. But Messiah has a very... According to now, 20th and 21st century Christianity, it's a very rude response. Right? It looks like this is tyranny. You have to follow me right now. You have to follow me right now. Get on your knees. I'll drag you down. And once again, I'm being facetious, dear brothers and sisters. That's where, that's the time you're living in. When Messiah says... What is Messiah's response when he asks for some time? Messiah says, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. What did we understand from that? Let the dead bury their own dead implies that the spiritually dead can bury the physically dead. And let that sink in each one of us. Let Ruach HaKadish speak to our hearts, dear brothers and sisters. Let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. Let the dead bury their own dead. But what should we do? You go and preach the kingdom of God. Have we taken that seriously? Or have we again allegorized it? Because we can say no negative comments about it. So we have now allegorized it. It's the same Method Satan always used because persecution did not let those first and second century 
True born again believers quit Christianity, quit Christ. So then he marries the church. The church is married to the world for Gamus. If we cannot say anything about their comment, we will say, oh, well, uh, it's not literally, he's not telling literally, it's, it's a stone way to say that we have to really go to church on Sundays. We really need to uh, get involved, if possible, in, our, in some form of church activities. We, per, we really need to make sure that we are following the command of tithing. Is that what Messiah telling us? Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Going and preaching the kingdom of God. Is it going to the building church every Sunday? And depending on which side of the globe, we are perhaps once one evening during, during the weekdays. Is that what Messiah telling us? And once again, we are hard on this, dear brothers and sisters. These are hard messages which Messiah lays on our hearts, which his Ruach speaks to us and we... Truly believe that God is speaking to someone through this message, dear brothers and sisters. If it is you, today is the day. Today is the day to drop the net. You will, once again, any effort. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 and 58, 58 tells us that every effort in Messiah will never be in vain. There is nothing which we do truly, being obedient to what Messiah is telling us, we, it will never be in vain. Do we truly believe it? Satan will make it nullify that, but do we truly believe it? That's the question today. Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. With a very little time, let's raise two more verses. Let's try to fit in two more verses. So Messiah says, basically, once again, let spiritually, let the spiritually dead can bury the physically dead but you go and preach the kingdom of God and then another this is the third person another also said Lord I will follow you but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house that is not a bad thing to say that is not a terrible thing to say Lord I want to follow you but it, can you please give me a couple of minutes I want I want to just say bye to everybody all my family members so that I won't see them for a long long time so the Lord I can come back and follow you. Is that, is that a terrible thing to say? What was Messiah's response? Sure. You can do that. I will wait here near the shores of Galilee. And I'm, once again, I'm being facetious, dear brothers and sisters. Messiah says what? No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's a scripture which we want to really take a print out and put it on our fridge, put it on the restroom mirror, put it on, put it in our car, on the dashboard, put it in our workspace, every single place possible. Make perhaps the wallpaper on our, on our cell phone. What scripture? Messiah says what? No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. When we have committed, we should be committed all the way. This is one way, dear brothers and sisters. No turning back. No turning back. Today is the day to burn all those bridges and go all the way for Christ. Go all the way. It is all going to be worth it on that day when Messiah embraces you and me and says, Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. You did not succumb to the circumstances, the pressures of the society of this world, the mocking and scoffing of your best friend and your own family members. You did not succumb because I empowered you and now you enter my joy. What a day! What a day it will be! Let's live for that moment. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. On this side of eternity we will be always poor in spirit. Because we are not home yet, dear brothers and sisters. We are not home yet. We are on enemy's turf. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. But God says he will see us through. Today, I choose to believe God's word. Will you please? Me and my family, today we choose. Choose to believe God's word that he will see us through the storms. Through the darkness. Through the valleys. 
through all kinds of insufficiencies and inadequacies. I don't know how it is going to work out. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I don't know that who holds that tomorrow. So I choose to believe in his promises irrespective of how it will all work out. But will you please, will you please, uh, dear brothers and sisters, will you please choose to believe him irrespective, irrespective of your circumstances and situations? No one, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No one. Messiah's servants should not have divided interests. Like a farmer who begins plowing and looks back. Messiah's servants should be committed. This is one way the narrow path only gets narrower and narrower and narrower. Let's pray for each other dear brothers and sisters. So that we can truly deny our flesh. It's not possible. It's not, it's impossible with our own strength. But not with his strength, not with Hashem's strength. It is not. Let us pray so that we can pick up our cross daily and follow him no matter what. Follow him no matter what. Even if you're hanging by that one thread, don't let go. Don't let go today. God will come through for you. Yes, dear brothers and sisters, on the other side of eternity. Messiah will embrace you and me on that day and say, Well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let us keep our eyes fixed on things with, which are unseen and not on things which are seen because things which are seen are mostly satanic. But things which are unseen are eternal. So let us pray together that may Messiah empower us in these last moments so that we can fix our eyes on things which are Unseen. We thank you so very much once again, all of your fellow brethren, for viewing us, for being a part of our spiritual family, dear brothers and sisters. More than words can ever, more than words can ever say. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters, for being our spiritual family, not unified by our, by our like mindedness, but by His Ruach. Only His Ruach can unify us, dear brothers and sisters. On the other side of eternity, what a day, what a day it will be. To share all our stories, how the miracles after miracles and miracles which Messiah has done in our lives, the greatest miracle being salvation, salvation, salvation has come in our lives. Let us praise and honor and glorify Him in the days that remain. And today, let us end with a short word of prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right, you can. Please go ahead. Lord Jesus, once again, I thank you, Lord, for once again reminding us that you are coming soon and extremely soon, Lord, to take us all home, Lord. And as we wait upon you, Lord, help us, Lord, to be in your presence, Lord, and to keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord, and not to live for this world, Lord, but for you, Lord. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Once again, thank you so much, Anna, for praying for us. And thank you so very much, all our dear fellow brethren, for viewing us, for being a part of our spiritual family. Dear brothers and sisters, we are almost at the finish line. Let the lies of the enemy, let us not give in to that. Let us, this is one way and we have decided to follow him. No one having, putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It's not through our strength and sufficiency we will survive in the days that remain. It is his Ruach which will empower us which will empower us for His greater glory. So let's keep praying for each other. And if you have once again any prayer requests, please, please do not hesitate to contact us, dear brothers and sisters, and all of your fellow brethren who has asked for prayers. We are indeed praying for each and every single of our fellow brethren so that Messiah's mighty will and perfect will be accomplished through each one of you. May He empower each one of you with His empowering grace to finish this race strong. And we thank you so very much, all of your fellow brethren, and may Lord God Almighty bless each and every one of you. Shalom.